I'd like to uh, welcome everyone and thank everyone for logging on to this uh, six month review, uh, virtual review of MSI. Um, I hope that uh, this gathering finds everyone well um, and safely navigating this, the echoes of uh, the COVID pandemic as it were. It has been an, uh, a pretty exciting six months. Uh, maybe exciting is not the right word, but uh, it has been eventful. Um, and it seems like it was only yesterday that we canceled our normal in-person format uh, for our summer meeting and decided to do this virtual uh, update instead. Uh, we did poll everyone. I think everyone was most comfortable with that outcome. Um, and although technology is really a wonderful thing, um, in, in my opinion, <laughs> maybe just me, it really falls far short of the character and atmosphere that we normally have when we're together um, in person to enjoy each other's company and to, and to share our stories. Uh, so um, in that regard, I apologize for, for not being able to host everyone here. I think it, it was the, the, the wise thing to do given the times uh, and we'll carry on. Um, and uh, and do our best to update you on uh, what has transpired, how we've done over the last six months. Um, and to Oscar, uh, our chairman, um, uh, my apologies for the swiftness of it all, uh, having to put this together on the fly, so to speak. Um, uh, it um, and and also not being able, not communicating effectively enough to coordinate with you. We will catch up later. I promise you that. Um, to uh, catch up and, uh, and make sure that we, we get these things coordinated better in the future. My plan is to present a review of the last six months uh, and then to open the virtual floor, so to speak, for, for questions and um, observations, comment, just conversation. Uh, but uh, before I begin, uh, what I would like to do is give just a brief, uh, you know, Zoom etiquette. Uh, we're all adapting to Zoom these days. So if you will, and I see that most of you have, uh, please mute your microphones. If you have other programs on your computer uh, that you're trying to work at the same time, you might wanna shut them down and just, spoke, just have Zoom open on your computer. Otherwise it might interfere with the transmission. Um, and um, if there is a question uh, during any part of this and uh, um, you would like to raise your hand. It should be in the lower right hand corner of your screen. If you look down at the bottom and you, uh, the bar at the very bottom, it says participants and chat and share screen, record, etc. Click on the participants and you'll see a window to the right that uh, shows everyone that is online with us. Okay. And before beginning, uh, before I begin uh, my update for everyone, uh, I would like to uh, welcome um, Dean Paul Goldwart joining us from Austin uh, and thank him for his leadership uh, and that of his team in Austin. It has been a very challenging and fast paced six months to say the very least. Um, and uh, we really appreciate the attention that has been paid, the communications that we've had uh, to carry us through the spring semester. Um, that's a story I'm gonna tell in just a few minutes. Uh, and, uh, but I will uh, yield a microphone to uh, Dean Goldbart to uh, say a few words of welcome and perhaps an update from Austin. Great, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Bob. Uh, and I also will refer to the past six months from time to time. Uh, <clears throat> I'm very, very pleased as always uh, to be with you, uh, members of the uh, Marine Science Institute community, and of course, the members of the Marine Science Advisory Council. It's terrific to see everybody. I've been scanning the screen back and forth and I'm very uh, pleased uh, that I know uh, many of you and I'm happy to uh, see you looking, uh, looking well. Uh, thanks for joining us in this format. Um, as Bob said, it's not ideal, but it's the best we have right now and, and uh, we'll absolutely make the best of it. Um, <clears throat> uh, and I do want to spend a little time talking about this um, astonishing time that we are experiencing in life, uh, in research, in education, in academia, and more broadly, um, I really do especially want to thank uh, Director Dickey. Uh, as you know, Bob has weathered a storm or two in the past um, and his experience, his wisdom, his attention to detail have been absolutely invaluable uh, this year. Together, our Austin campus leaders uh, and Bob and his team at the Port Aransas campus 
are working really hard uh, to ensure the safety of every student, every staff member, every faculty member, while we also maintain excellent teaching and important scientific research. Um, there's no doubt that outstanding leadership really counts at a moment like this. And I am enormously grateful uh, to Bob and his team for their partnership. Uh, we have a great deal happening in the college to ensure a safe return uh, to research and to on-campus learning. Uh, certainly far and away the most com complex episode in my uh, own uh, life. Uh, on the other hand, uh, I must say that I don't think I've ever felt a greater sense of purpose uh, either. Uh, so I will tell you, I, I am not complaining. I feel privileged to be healthy, to have a job and to have the opportunity to have some impact. Meanwhile, uh, our individual scientists are making tremendous headway in the fight against COVID-19. Uh, some of them are uh, assuredly at the world's stage center um, and uh, it really inspires me to feel that we've arrived at science's place in the spotlight, uh, its rightful place, I would say. Well, as you know, in our line of work, we are explorers. Uh, we're seeking to tease out from nature. Uh, nature so carefully guards its secrets, uh, seeking to tease out new lessons about the ruthless inner workings of the SARS-CoV-2 virus, the patterns and structure of the cosmos, the intricate chemical and biological composition of our uh, oceans, which greatly dictate the health of life on Earth. Uh, scientific explorers, including those from the University of Texas at Austin and in Port Aransas, help move us critical steps closer to unlocking these mysteries. Uh, when these mysteries are revealed, they save lives, they enlighten minds, and they help us protect our precious planet. So I'll name just a few remarkable scientists who are on my mind as we wind down one really strange academic year and prepare to begin another. Uh, some of our scientists are demonstrating uh, national and international leadership uh, in the fight against the pandemic. Associate Professor of Molecular Biosciences, Jason McClellan, has been studying coronaviruses for years. At least four of the vaccines selected for Operation Warp Speed feature a modified spike protein, protein that Jason himself and his collaborators engineered for vaccine purposes. And these include vaccines that are already in the last stage of human trials. So we can thank Jason and his team for getting us closer to uh, protection. Now vaccines typically take a, a decade or longer to develop. Four years is regarded as miraculous. But Jason and many health experts believe that a COVID-19 vaccine could arrive this autumn. This would be extraordinary. So when you hear about the astonishing speed at which this is happening, please know that years of basic research by Jason before we'd ever heard of the coronavirus have played an essential role, as has his ferociously hard work over the past six, seven, eight months. What a compelling example of Louis Pasteur's dictum that chance favors the prepared mind. Professor of Integrative Biology and Statistics and Data Science, Lauren Ansel Myers has advised states, cities, school districts, and even the White House, explaining in great detail how the virus spreads and what various mitigation strategies could do if adopted. As the leader, of one of a handful of teams advising the CDC. She also skillfully translates her mathematical and epidemiological research to provide insights for decision makers. In media reports, she has been the most cited expert on the UT faculty for any reason all year. And stories about these two scientists, Jason and Lauren, about their research have appeared in outlets that have reached billions with a B, billions of people the world over. What a powerful demonstration of the UT motto, what starts here changes the world. Faculty in our Department of Computer Science have founded our newest university-wide institute, our machine learning laboratory. And machine learning is the ability of artificial intelligence systems to develop the capacity to automatically and accurately make predictions from data on their own. One of the faculty involved is Peter Stone, 
who has been leading our robotics consortium and a University of Texas Grand Challenge in Ethical Artificial Intelligence. Peter chaired a national study on the next 100 years in artificial intelligence, and that takes some nerve. Uh, things are changing on a monthly timescale, so, so to project out 100 years is uh, bold and something we admire and encourage. <clears throat> and in addition to being a professor, Peter serves as the executive director of Sony AI, Sony Artificial Intelligence in America. He's one of many faculty who will be able to conduct transformative machine learning research, not only for UT, but for Austin and the state, thanks in large part to the remarkable generosity of donors Zabe and Amir Hussein. This year, we celebrated three, three new UT Austin members receiving one of the top honors there is for scientific research, induction into the US National Academy of Sciences. And all three were from the College of Natural Sciences. John Cormandy, who was the Vaughan Centennial Chair in Astronomy, helped reshape our understanding of galaxies. Katie Fries, who holds our Kodosky Chair in Physics, conducts research into dark matter that has been absolutely transformational. And Mark Kirkpatrick, who holds the Painter Professorship in Genetics, Mark is an evolutionary biologist whose work helped explain how mating preferences helped drive the development of male traits. Well, just a word about the National Academy of Sciences. The Academy is a private, non-profit society of distinguished scientists who are elected to membership by their peers in recognition of their outstanding contribution to research. Well, since when? Well, the Bill for Incorporation of the Academy was brought to the US Senate on February the 20th, 1863. It was passed by the Senate on March the 3rd, 1863, and passed by the House of Representatives later that day. Think of it, 1863, right in the middle of the Civil War, a calamitous time for the nation. And what did President Lincoln do in the face of the calamity? Before the day was over, March the 3rd, 1863, Lincoln signed into existence the National Academy of Sciences, an academy charged by Congress with providing independent objective advice to the nation on matters related to science and technology. And on behalf of scientists and everybody everywhere, thank you, Mr. Lincoln. I hope I have time to mention just a few things from the educational and operational fronts too. This year, we've been faced with the challenge of rewiring everything the college does in a landscape filled with natural and very real concerns for children, parents, finances, research groups, laboratories, students, and more. And our community is standing and delivering. Not because we've told them what to do or how to do it, but because they've self-organized. Unexpected leaders have emerged they care and they're getting the job done. And never have I been more impressed with this community or any other community I have ever been a part of. In summary, everything has changed and yet nothing has. We remain dependent on creative new thinking from remarkable people. We are as focused as ever on leading and changing the world in our research, in teaching and in public engagement. We aim to inspire new generations to go out into the world with a robust understanding of what science, mathematics, and computing are, and the capacity to make the world a better, safer place. And as we accompany our students on their journeys, we get to watch their awakening to the astonishing capabilities brought about through science, mathematics, and computing. The supply of food and medicines, water and power, transportation, communication, and so much more. Science's ability to harness human creativity and reason for beneficial ends is not only the key to making it through our COVID-19 era, but through every era. Discovery brought humankind out of caves, and it's our best bet for ensuring that we don't have to return to caves, no matter how challenging the times we face. And because of that, we in the College of Natural Sciences thank you all for your commitment to 
and your support of science. Thank you. And I'd be happy to take any questions. If anyone has a question, please just unmute yourself and go ahead and ask. Okay. Thank you, Paul. That was Thank a, great, you. a great contribution, great introduction to the, to the session. I mean, to, the, Thanks, to this review. Thank you. Thank you. All right. And uh, so what I'd like to do next is, um, is uh, share my screen for my presentation. Let's see if I can make it work. I think I always think I'm technologically competent enough, but uh, you never know these days. You know, so I've had my moments. So, all right. Can everyone see the screen? Good. Very good. Yes. All right. Very good. Thank you. Um, well, I'd like to begin with uh, just a, a quick overview. Um, this is going to be an abbreviated six-month review of uh, MSI. What's been happening here? Um, how we fared? You know, during the spring semester and then in, uh, in through the COVID crisis, uh, the opening from the opening salvos, you know, to where we are today, um, somewhere in the reverberation stage of the uh, of the pandemic. I'm going to cover uh, COVID-19 updates, uh, discoveries uh, that have that we have still been able, our faculty have still persevered and been able to uh, contribute to the body of science, scientific knowledge, and marine biosphere. Uh, a little bit on hurricane recovery, uh, educational updates on our students, awards and announcements, uh, a new in potential international partnership with uh, an entity in uh, Mexico. I'm going to talk about our regional engagement, uh, specifically on the channel uh, development plans in the Corpus Christi area. And then uh, we'll uh, finish with uh, some discussion on the uh, February uh, MSAC for 2021. So first, the COVID update. Um, our current status is that we are working at 40% capacity. Um, that means 40% of the personnel on campus at any one time. Um, and we're doing that, we're including 100% of our personnel generally, or not, not totally, but you know, largely, um, by rotating shifts. In other words, we have a morning eight hour period and we have an afternoon eight hour period. Um, and so, and with one hour in between, uh, so that we can, we can maintain the continuity of our research operations as well as prepare for the fall semester. Um, it's been a, uh, a very fast paced uh, moving target all along as, uh, as UT Austin and scheduling and the registrar's office and our group, uh, or, or coordinate and, uh, and make sure that we have everything ready for the fall semester. We are also operating under a firm COVID-19 daily protocols to reduce the risk um, of our students, our staff, and our faculty. And we're using a, a combination of uh, self-health assessments before people even leave home and arrive on campus to be sure that they are not uh, feeling any symptoms or, or feeling ill in any way. We ask them to take their temperature at home, and uh, we also do it at, when they arrive at work. Uh, we stagger the entry into the building. We've restricted the number of entries in and out of buildings um, all on campus. Uh, we have hand sanitation stations. We, uh, we have masks. We have gloves, latex gloves or nitrile gloves. And we have infrared thermometers at every entrance so everyone can monitor their own temperature before they enter the building. All of this, in addition to the staggering of our uh, custodial staff to sanitize all high touch surfaces um, and uh, provide uh, disinfectant and personal protective supplies to our uh, faculty, staff, and students as they, as they move in and out of the buildings on their regular, on their schedules. So we're doing everything we can to keep everyone safe. Uh, we are, uh, uh, communicating frequently with uh, with everyone to make sure that they're aware of what's uh, what's going on on the outside and it's not as if they don't follow it already uh, but uh, we try to reemphasize that and um, and in that way uh, creating a safe environment as safe as we can possibly make it um, we are able to continue with our research and our preparations for the fall uh, our campuses and facilities are closed and will remain closed to the general public um, and all public facing programs. 
um, until further notice. Um, and this is UT Austin wide. It's not just UT Austin, it's almost every university and every uh, public institution um, in, the, in the state now. So um, that's where we are on COVID. So far, we've been faring fairly well. We've had a few scary moments where we've had uh, some of our personnel in uh, acknowledging being in the, in the vicinity of COVID positive people that they found out, that they found out afterwards. Um, and we followed up with the appropriate measures to make sure that they were, that they were healthy before they were able to return you know, to campus and, uh, and, and come into you know, even a personally distanced contact with the rest of our staff, faculty and students. So I think that we've done everything that we can. We're taking, uh, of course, UT Austin has put out uh, just a, a tremendous amount of guidance on, on how we need to conduct our operations and, uh, and to pick up our research where we left off when, we, when uh, COVID went into hyperdrive uh, around um, the end of March, beginning of April. Uh, but we've navigated this successfully in my mind. And uh, so we're, we're, we're in very good shape given the circumstances that we all are dealing with at the present time. <clears throat> so I'd like to just transition into uh, discoveries. I think that was the next slide. Yeah, that was the next slide. Um, just to illustrate the perseverance and resilience of uh, our faculty and their students, even working remotely um, uh, from their homes, um, they were able to get refocused on uh, assimilating and, and uh, preparing uh, the data that they already had in hand um, to uh, prepare manuscripts and new proposals for funding coming into the future. Um, and, um, and in some cases, we had uh, some, faculty, some faculty research groups, um, we had limited access to their laboratories and to the field. Um, but uh, we had to do some very, very careful planning on all of that to make sure that we weren't endangering anyone uh, either on the support staff side or the students and faculty themselves as they drove on to um, to continue their research programs and not lose too much time uh, due to the COVID lockdowns that uh, we all experienced. So some of the things that have happened uh, in the last six months, including uh, identifying a hidden source of carbon, you know, found in the Arctic coast. This was a uh, Jim McClellan and his team, they published a study um, on a previously unknown groundwater source and, and a flow of dissolved organic matter that enters the uh, Ar Arctic coastal waters uh, above this frozen permafrost. Uh, so it's like a submerged layer creeping through the, uh, through the, the subsurface layers of the earth uh, above the permafrost into the coastal waters. It's a significant source of carbon and other nutrients that are charging the coastal Arctic uh, food web. So this was uh, published in a highly prestigious journal and, uh, and garnered quite a bit of attention. Another is changing the code, naming a new naming system for microbes. Uh, this is uh, Brett Baker and his collaborators and students uh, who are shaking up basically the international code for the nomenclature of prokaryotic organisms um, and to include so that it will in the future include new species that have not been cultured in the laboratory. Previously, uh, new species were not uh, permitted uh, using the current guidelines until they had been cultured in the laboratory. But with the new innovations and technologies and methods that have been developed for environmental DNA sampling uh, directly from the environment, uh, there is a shift going on in the, in the field of systematics uh, that will uh, really transform um, our understanding of the breadth and diversity of life on Earth. Brett and his students and collaborators are making great strides um, in the discovery of new phyla uh, and species of marine microbes um, and characterizing their roles in the ecology of the marine biosphere from the estuary to the ocean depths. Um, as you all know, we've sent uh, highlights before of uh, showing the, the deep sea submersible Alvin uh, on the uh, research ship Atlantis that uh, Brett and, uh, uh, was able to go down, uh, I don't know, I, I don't remember how deep it was, but it was very, very deep into the thermal vents on the bottom of the Gulf of California. Just phenomenal work. Um, if you build it, fish will come. Uh, 
PhD student Derek Bolser and uh, a student of Brad Erisman's group uh, published a study in uh, marine coastal fisheries on the diversity of species and the distribution of fish populations on over 54 oil platforms out in the Gulf of Mexico. That's Gulf of Mexico wide. They did all of that sampling and then uh, characterized the, the vertical uh, distribution of fish species uh, fish species as well as the lateral uh, geographic distribution. A great contribution to the uh, to the field of uh, marine fisheries and understanding exactly what the what the role and and uh, uh, purpose of uh, substrates are to fish congregation. Um, another uh, great discovery using lipids to understand food chains. As everyone knows uh, omega-3 fatty acids and lipids are essential to life. Uh, and Zhen Shen Hao, a uh, uh, PhD student in Lee Fuman's laboratory, uh, presented new research findings about the flow of essential bad fatty acids through the marine food chains and how disruptions in those food chains uh, can affect the health status of different trophic levels uh, from invertebrate to fish to vertebrates. Uh, and, and the specific, and, and also the, the implications of that on the health of our coastal fisheries. Uh, very, very interesting and important work uh, to elucidate what's, what, uh, how nature works um, and how energy flows back and forth. Uh, Peter Thomas uh, continues his, uh, his great work on membrane receptors involved in treatment of epilepsy. This is a new one. It, uh, it is translational work that moves from the basic work in marine science and fish reproductive physiology into the realm of human health and medicine. Uh, Peter has already published, I don't know how many papers on, on a variety of different steroid hormone receptors that are common or were found, that, were, that are found on fish eggs, but are also found in certain uh, cell uh, groupings, um, uh, cancerous shells, cell, cells, for, for example, in um, prostate and in, in breast cancer an example, as an example. Now these new uh, discoveries on receptors that have an impact on the treatment of epilepsy is a new wrinkle and a new addition to his, his research uh, progress. And we've had two major reviews on the first microbial archaea. Again, that's Brett Baker's work um, and uh, Brad Erisman on Red Snapper. Uh, these are major contributions assimilating the body of knowledge on uh, these two subject matters that are a reference point for all scientists that study uh, microbes in the marine environment and fisheries. Uh, they reference these types of works so that they are up to date on the current status of knowledge. Uh, this is a, a very important function of, uh, of top level scientists to make sure that their assimilation of knowledge and their consolidation uh, and presentation of it in a coherent fashion is made available to the rest of the scientific community. And then it radiates out from there into policy, into practice, into the public realm, where we actually implement uh, some of the, some lessons from the knowledge that's been gathered. So that handles uh, discovery. Um, now I'd like to you know, transition into Hurricane recovery and uh, and a recent near miss by Hurricane Hannah, uh, which uh, was was a very uh, fast developing storm, just like Hurricane Harvey was. Uh, Harvey came on us uh, very fast and very hard. It was a Category Four hurricane. Uh, most recently, on July 25th, uh, Hurricane Hannah uh, came ashore about oh, 30 miles south of uh, North Padre Island. Um, we got a lot of wind. Uh, we got a lot of rain, um, not nearly as much as Harvey. It was only a category one storm, this Hannah. Uh, we did suffer a few, uh, some damage uh, to uh, electrical systems uh, in, on several of our buildings, but nothing that we can't uh, address uh, very quickly. Uh, but uh, we're, we were prepared. We actually made it to phase two of our hurricane preparations uh, as uh, Hurricane Hannah uh, approached the Texas coastline. Uh, we didn't know which way it was going to go. Um, and uh, we were still within the cone of uncertainty on where the landing would actually take place. So everyone performed brilliantly. Um, we had everything covered and ready to go. Everyone was home. We did not need to evacuate this time because we, we were watching the strength. It was cycling back and forth between a tropical storm and a, and a, and a category one hurricane. 
Um, and so uh, we, met, we weathered that, that challenge uh, quite efficiently and uh, came back to work uh, the following Monday um, to resume our operations and get everything uncovered and, and start the cycle over again. Uh, recovering from Hurricane Harvey in 2017 is an ongoing uh, uh, effort. Uh, we are making progress on our rebuild. Uh, we are hardening. Uh, we are repurposing some things uh, that were destroyed during Harvey and, uh, and putting them in locations where they won't be vulnerable to uh, inclement weather ever again. Uh, we're trying to make the wise decisions that need to be made. And um, we're also um, taking this time because we've got a lot of contractors uh, on campus and or on our on our grounds and a few of only a few of them in the buildings themselves uh, but we're taking uh, this opportunity as uh, as Benjamin Franklin once said you know in adversity uh, you can find opportunities and uh, so we're finding those opportunities and having that uh, that talent the construction talent nearby to address some of our long-standing issues in terms of facilities and housing uh, here you see our main, one of our main teaching wet labs uh, on the west wing of the main research laboratory. And here you see how we've transformed that um, into a modern uh, all PVC uh, bench work uh, that uh, is waterproof. So we can hose down this entire room uh, when our fisheries biologists go in there and start dissecting fish, uh, which is uh, not, not a very neat uh, process. Uh, so um, here you can see in the upper right hand corner, um, this is the the old Fisheries Americultural Laboratory greenhouse. They call it a greenhouse because it was sort of opaque panels on the side um, that contained or that housed uh, large fish tanks. Down below uh, you see the new, this uh, the upper right structure was just was demolished and we put the one below in its place that's called the uh, Ed Rochelle Greenhouse right now. It's not a greenhouse, obviously, so we're gonna be renaming it. Uh, but it was the Rochelle Foundation that contributed the funding to make this happen. And uh, here you see in the upper left what the previous uh, aquaculture space looked like with the tanks and disrepair and the building in disrepair. And now below and on to the right, you see what it looks like now. Uh, this is a, uh, an essential uh, aquaculture space uh, that is uh, necessary for the Fisheries Americulture Laboratory to function. Um, and uh, we will be uh, occupying it with fish and experiments in the very near future as we press forward with, uh, with updating our damaged facilities, both from Hurricane Harvey, but also due to expectations and standards regulations that are applied for the institutional use of animals in research. Our marina has made great progress. Of course, we started this project before Hurricane Harvey in 2017, and um, it's been a slog, um, but we've, we've, we've really started uh, to gain momentum now. Uh, the status of the marina is as you see in, in front of you now. Uh, we've got uh, new uh, sheet piles and, and bulkhead, bulkheads. Um, and uh, we think that this is going to be completed by the end of September, beginning of October. Uh, they're making good progress on it, and we will continue to press on that going forward. Um, uh, the research pier, um, you can see, I hope you can see my cursor um, as I circle it over the barge here that is in place to pick up the debris or what was left over from our research pier after it was hit by that drill ship in 2017. It's on the bottom of the channel here and they had to remove that first before the, we could begin the new pier, uh, constructing the new pier. Um, and here's where we are on that. Uh, these are pre-stressed uh, you know, pre concrete uh, pilings that are into the channel um, and we're, we're progressing on uh, completing this, uh, working with the Corps of Engineers for adjustments in our permitting process because we put, couldn't put those pilings back in the same holes uh, on the bottom of the channel that uh, the previous pier was located. So uh, we're, we're making a few adjustments and we expect to get this going again by in the next several months. 
Our Bay Education Center in uh, Rockport uh, was damaged by Hurricane Harvey in 2017. Uh, the envelope of the building uh, needed uh, some repairs. The roofing needed some repairs. That was completed. Uh, we've uh, reinstalled the, a new uh, version of the Science on a Sphere. Uh, and we're in the uh, last stages of, of completing the displays and public interface um, in the uh, the Bay Education Center. Uh, we've contracted out a, uh, a local Corpus Christi group to, uh, to help us uh, construct all of these displays and it's making great progress. And we hope to have this open sometime uh, mid-fall as well. The Patton Marine Science Education Center, of course, has been renamed from last time, from last year. Uh, we are still uh, in the design development phase for the replacement of our aquaria and public exhibits. Uh, this is the public face of marine science um, it, that is normally visited in better times, uh, uh, earlier times of upwards of, of 20 to 25,000 people a year. Um, well, we're going to update it all. Uh, we've engaged a, uh, a West Coast firm that, uh, that actually did the design work for the Monterey Bay Aquarium to help us with the redesign and development of aquaria and, uh, and uh, exhibits uh, in this public space. And, uh, we expect to get it started with it very, very soon. We're making good progress on that. Um, the entrance monument sign, as you know, during Hurricane Harvey, our entrance monument signs were both destroyed. Were destroyed, um, and so we um, we went to you, our council, and asked if you might be able to help us with this. And many of you uh, st stepped up and and provided the uh, the resources necessary to complete and plan and, and complete this. Uh, this new monument sign that will be in place uh, off Cotter Street, the front entrance of the Marine Science Institute. Uh, we're very thankful for uh, Kent Olberg for donating. Uh, this is going to be a six foot, uh, no, a seven foot uh, bronze marlin uh, that will grace the, uh, the entry monument. Um, and you can see that we've already broken ground on it here. So we'll be orienting it uh, in the right, you know, angle to the to the university in the coming in the coming uh, week, and we expect to have this started uh, within the next week or two. Actually, uh, we've made great progress on that one. As you know, uh, the Lund House has been in, in existence on Terrence Street. Uh, it is uh, where we ask, uh, where we you know provide quarters for the dean when he comes down to visit us, and uh, where dignitaries we put uh, we put in there. Uh, visiting scientists, uh, maybe even faculty recruits. Uh, it, is a, it is an accommodation that we need to be able to host um, uh, visiting scholars, uh, the dean, visiting groups. Um, and uh, it was, the building was basically rendered irreparable after Hurricane Harvey. And so we have uh, commissioned an architect in, um, in uh, Corpus Christi, Turner Ramirez Architects, to design us a new replacement Lund House. And this is what it should look like. And uh, we're hoping to get this started sometime in the next uh, several months. Um, it's taken a while to get everything lined up on this. But it's a, it's a great design. It's going to be very functional, not only for uh, housing uh, visiting dignitaries, but also for small special group functions, such as the Marine Science Advisory Council board meetings and such. So, uh, we have also uh, received funding, uh, uh, supplemental funding uh, for emergency for Hurricane Harvey uh, response from the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. And part of that funding is gonna be used to, uh, to expand upon our dormitory capacity. We lost 38 beds in dorms A, B, and C during Hurricane Harvey. Um, those buildings uh, dated back to the 1890s. There were wood stick structures. And um, not only were they inappropriately, de inappropriately designed for the, what we needed them for, uh, they weren't actually very safe buildings. We had asbestos problems with them. Uh, we had structural problems. We had design problems with them. So we just bulldoze them to the ground and now we've designed a new dormitory expansion of 34 beds we're not going to be able to make up all of them we don't have the budget for it but 
Um, this is planned uh, in the final stages of planning uh, and uh, we hope that uh, we will be able to get this started in the fall. So, uh, so that was the, uh, that's where we are on, on hurricane repair uh, and, and from Hurricane Harvey. Um, at any one time we have anywhere, we've had up to 40 projects going at one time on this campus. Bob, large, may I large ask to small. A question? Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's Taddy. Yeah. Um, what about across the street at the Wilson Cottages? Weren't you going to do something over there? Yes, we have something there as well. And we're working through those plans um, as we speak. I only had so many, I didn't want to take up too much time on the slideshow. I wanted to move through it. I presented the Wilson Cottage, uh, Wilson Village build out uh, at our last in-person advisory council meeting and that uh, those plans are still in place. Okay. So now I'll transition over to um, our student uh, accomplishments. Uh, we've had a great group uh, that recently defended their master's thesis or their PhD dissertations. Um, in the, just the last three weeks, um, the, the COVID outbreak put a stall on a lot of our students' ability to continue their progress in their research to reach their graduation date so that it wasn't pushed back. But they were very incredibly resilient. Uh, they actually adapted to the uh, remote uh, uh, working environment and still made progress on their theses. And wherever we could, we were able to assist them in getting them out into the field to collect those last samples that they needed to uh, collect uh, from, uh, from the estuary or, or from near shore, uh, and also provide that core analytical uh, facilities for the analysis of the samples that they were bringing in. Uh, we worked very, very hard to make this work for our students uh, so, that, uh, so that they were not further delayed in their graduation. And uh, I was very, very pleased to see um, Arlie Muth, um, uh, Jinshu, Heng Chin Wei, Yida Gao, Alexis Kursagara, Janelle Estrada, and Leanne Martin all progressed uh, to the stage of defending their theses or their dissertations, and they will all be graduating either um, this fall uh, or uh, in, the, in the following spring. It, there's, a there's a gradient of uh, where they are in exactly in their, in their closing uh, preparations of their, or their theses and dissertations. So uh, they've done a superb job. I'd like to call out uh, uh, Leanne Martin in particular. Leanne is going to be transitioning to the Archer Center in Washington, D.C. That is a UT uh, uh, center uh, in Washington uh, that works with the uh, Johnson School uh, on um, policy. Uh, so she's very much interested in uh, environmental policy and will be pursuing uh, further uh, training and studies uh, in Washington, D.C. A lot of the others, uh, I'm not sure exactly of their plans. They're in the, they're in the process of uh, planning their next moves, probably postdoctoral studies in some location. Um, going back to uh, um, our, our semester uh, by the sea, which was spring term, um, Sally uh, put a, a really cute uh, update on our, on our website. It did end with a Zoom, literally and figuratively. Uh, figuratively. Um, it was uh, the week of March 16th that, this, uh, that the pandemic really uh, hit hard here in Port Aransas. Uh, that week of the 16th was spring break. Um, and half of our undergraduate students that were here for Semester by the Sea um, left the campus and went to other locations, either home or some other location for their spring break. Then the, 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 the lockdown came. Those students could not come back to campus. We weren't able to allow them back. But the six that we did have that remained on campus, we retained, we kept them here. Um, after consulting with Austin and, and, and making sure that we had everything in place that needed to be in place to keep them safe and secure. Uh, the six students that you see on the upper right were just a phenomenal, resilient undergraduate class. They did so well and they were so mature and responsible in taking care not only of themselves, uh, but 
listening to the guidance that we had to offer and adapting to things on the fly. It got down to the case where we weren't actually able to get, let some of these students back into the laboratory to finish their semester studies. Um, and so we had to do a lot of things virtually and dig up historical data and totally revamp their, their curriculum in order for them to complete the semester. And they did so, and they did so in high fashion. Um, I'm very, very proud of this group. Um, in addition to that, um, we're now preparing for our fall semester. And uh, as it stands right now, um, up in Austin, they're doing a mixture of in-person and virtual uh, instruction uh, for the fall semester. All of our curriculum, both graduate and undergraduate, is right now, can, we're, we're going to try to do it in person. But we need to be prepared in case there is another echo of uh, COVID uh, sometime in the fall when we're in the middle, in the middle of classes. So uh, we are actually taking videos um, of field instruction and laboratory instruction uh, with our instructors. Chris Biggs is uh, a lecturer, um, actually graduated uh, two years ago and came back to help us and teach. Um, he's a phenomenal instructor and a phenomenal man. Um, but anyway, they, they've been out into the field actually videoing, taking videos of all of their, of their field instruction. So if those students in Austin cannot come to Port Aransas to, com to complete their field studies in order for, to complete their curriculum, then we will be able to conduct those, uh, instruct that instruction online. It won't be as good uh, and it won't, you know, they're not going to get their hands wet. They're not going to get their, their feet muddy, but it's better than the, than not doing it all. So these are the ways that we are tried, that we are adapting to constantly changing circumstances. And um, I couldn't be prouder of the faculty for picking up on Zoom instruction so quickly um, and uh, for them adapting their, their syllabi, their syllabus for every course that they do. It has to be re totally rewritten uh, to accommodate not only the safety precautions that have to be put in place to make sure that everyone is safe and their health is protected, but also to take into account the possibility of virtual instruction, which is not as good as in-person instruction. So in a way, um, I used to tease them, I guess it was a, a semester or two ago, when we started using virtual instruction, we, we do that all the time anyway from stu for students in Austin, but now it's a lot more of it. I told them I was going to get the drama department to come down to give them acting lessons so that they're a little bit more animated on screen and uh, more comfortable uh, with uh, actually teaching uh, through a online link. Our public and K-12 education. Um, now I'm going to shift over to the NER. This is our public face. This is, this is where science is, is moved directly into the, into the public, into our K-12 uh, charges that uh, normally we have on campus on a regular basis, you know, taking a field trip out with the KD or taking a walk through the Wetlands Education Center uh, into the Marine Science Education Center that we're revamping now normally uh, that we would actually use as a backdrop as well. But this is a talented group of, uh, of educators, marine educators um, that, uh, that work at the, our National Estuarine Research Reserve. And they have put on and, and, and organized and prepared and uploaded uh, a lot of, uh, of videos uh, to continue their, their interaction with the public, with K-12, uh, so that, uh, that they, don't lose, they don't lose that time. They don't lose opportunities. They are taking advantage of technology to make sure that they still connect with the public. So, for example, Jace will go on a beach combing and a beach walk, and uh, he'll he'll walk down the beach and and uh, pick something up or point something out and explain, you know, what the significance of it is and and what the implications of it are uh, for the health of our environment and uh, for the public health as well. Uh, speaking of uh, plastic waste and debris on our beaches and so forth. Um, and we have other videos where we have specific topical matters that are being taught. Uh, we, uh, they filmed, our, our nurse staff filmed uh, scenes behind the animal rehabilitation keep so they can see. Uh, it's sort of like that, what's that show, uh, the, the, the Mike, what's his name that, that teaches tough jobs, you know? Um, 
the dirty side of the work, you know, that uh, it all seems so glamorous, you know, from uh, when you think about, you know, birds and turtles and so forth. But if, when you really get into it, it's a lot of work and it's not that, not that appealing when you have your hands up to your elbows in, uh, in bird stuff. So, <laughs> uh, and we have a talk science to me. This, these are cameos or um, uh, elevator speeches from all of our students and our faculty that are put online. Uh, so folks can access what our faculty and students are doing and their, their passion for the work that they do. Free Your Mind is a, a sort of a meditative uh, uh, session where uh, they put in seascapes and sea scenes and so forth. And in Science in the Sea, for example, up here, marine viruses, uh, we also have those online so that you can actually uh, hear a uh, uh, public presentation um, of specific topics in marine science that are particularly relevant at the time. So that's all going very well. We have also this year, we celebrate staff service, 10 years of service by uh, B. Lyman, uh, Betty Lopez, Renee Lopez, John Nichols, Nicholas, Sarah Pelletieri. These are, the, these are the folks that make this institute work. Um, they are the reason that we are able to operate now uh, because they, uh, they are the foundation. They build, they maintain the facilities, they keep the systems working. They keep it sanitized. They are the ones that actually uh, enable our faculty and our students to operate not only in a safe environment, but a clean environment and to do more because they chip in. They do things well beyond just the custodial and the cooking and the, you know, the facilities maintenance. They do a lot more than that. Uh, Patty Webb, 30 years of service. Amazing. Absolutely amazing. And uh, Patty's critical. Congratulations, Patty. So thank you for that. And this year we had a University of Texas President's Outstanding Staff Award. Uh, Captain Frank Ernst uh, was uh, one of 30 uh, out of, out of uh, the population of UT Austin that was recognized for his service. Uh, he, Frank, I obviously, I mean, as, as a captain of our boating, of our boats, and um, is uh, instrumental not only in maintaining the fleet of uh, vessels that we take out onto the, into the Gulf and into the estuary, but also um, training our students and staff and faculty on operating a boat. He is also our dive master. So anyone that goes into scientific diving, this is the guy you go to. So. Uh, Frank has just been essential for this institute over the many years that he served. And uh, so we are very, very thankful to have him uh, on board. Other awards and announcements. Uh, these are very special uh, recognitions from uh, a variety of sources. Brett Baker was awarded a significant funding to study the origins of eukaryotic cells. We actually heard him speak about this yesterday at the Dean's monthly uh, research review of every department. The Dean moves from department, department, department uh, every, every month to, uh, to hear what kinds of research and to, um, and to actually meet and, and interact with uh, the talented faculty that populate the College of Natural Sciences. Uh, Brett was one of them yesterday and, uh, and here's, uh, he's just done superb, superbly at MSI. He is also, uh, th this award was from the Simons and Moore Foundations, but he was also a, uh, a, uh, a fellow of the Simons Foundation uh, this year as well. So he's been at an early career uh, fellowship award from the Simons Foundation. Andrew Espa was awarded the CNS Stengel Wire Research Grant. This is a brand new initiative uh, that the Dean has put together uh, it is a, an endowment uh, by a uh, illustrious uh, faculty member and uh, an alumni of uh, UT uh, that has a, a sufficient payout every year that it can, it, that is being used to fund uh, grants and fellowships across the College of Natural Science. Very competitive process. This is the inaugural, uh, inaugural year uh, that uh, this Stingle Wire Awards, Research Awards, program was put into place, and Andrew was one of the first awarded. Uh, also, um, Angelina DiCera, um, a student 
was the inaugural Stingle Wire Graduate Fellow. Uh, and a Company of Biologists Traveling Fellowship also uh, was awarded to uh, Angelina. And this year we are welcoming four new faculty, actually two new faculty this year, two more in the spring. Um, Jessica O'Connell in the upper right. I'm not, I don't know why it's doing it. Jessica O'Connell in the upper right. Uh, uh, Kristen uh, Nielsen below her. Uh, will arrive uh, in, well, Kristen's actually on North Padre Island. Uh, she'll be uh, visiting her office and lab as soon as we can get her cleared through the process of our preventive measures uh, for COVID. Um, and then um, Jessica O'Connell will join us in October. Um, Simon Brandle and Casey Jordan will join us in January. They are coming in from France. And so um, they've got a bit more of a, of a, of a trip you know, to, to make uh, getting to Port Aransas. But we really look forward to having them. We're preparing the laboratories and their office spaces now as we speak to, to make them welcome and, and give them a, a good push start as they, uh, they join our department. Very, very excited about that. Additional awards and announcements uh, for 20, uh, 2020, 21, Derek Bolser uh, of the Arisman Lab uh, received a one year full support uh, and stipend uh, from of the several of our endowments that uh, that were made possible by our advisory council and others. Um, and Xinxin Hao uh, from the Fuman Lab also received one year full support from our endowments, including stipend. And Charles Tang of the Busky Lab received full support for the fall semester, including stipend and tuition. Uh, this is a competitive process. Every year we have a bit of payout from all of those endowments and we put together a committee. They go through the records and, and performance and accomplishments of all of our graduate students that apply for additional scholarship funding, and they are awarded according to merit. So it's a, it's a very successful program, and I'm very, very thankful to have this resource uh, that is really originated with the Advisory Council uh, and with, uh, with the donors uh, that uh, contribute so much uh, to the Marine Science Institute, not only in funding, but in their expertise and their just support. Uh, we'd like to, uh, we did announce already once, I'd like to just reiterate that we're super grateful for Bobby Patton's donation of $1 million to further flounder research, as everyone knows. Uh, and uh, if you're a fisherman amongst the uh, advisory council, everyone knows that the flounder fishery is in a bit of a spot. Uh, it's, not as, as, uh, it's not as robust and vibrant as it once was. And uh, there are concerns about being able to sustain it over the long term. And it is not just in Texas. This is actually goes all the way up the East Coast, uh, around the Gulf and into the, into the East Coast. So we, the purpose of, the, of this funding is to better understand the reproductive physiology and capacity of Southern flounder and how that might be, that information might be useful uh, to the Texas Parks and Wildlife uh, Fisheries Commission or committee uh, to better manage that fishery so it will be sustainable going into the future. So very, very special thanks to Bobby for his contribution to uh, this important research effort. Uh, on March 9th, before we ran into the COVID wall, um, we had a visitor from Mexico. His name is Andrea, Adrian uh, Sada Gonzalez uh, from Monterey. He is the CEO of uh, Grupo Vitro, which is the largest glass manufacturer um, in Latin America and one of the largest in the world. Uh, auto, think automotive glass, industrial glass, all that sort of thing. Um, and his family, going back to the, uh, to, um, back a hundred years, what appears to be a hundred years, um, created a, a uh, organization, a conservation research organization, uh, uh, Vida Silvestre. Um, heretofore, he's been focused on terrestrial conservation. He's worked with the San Diego Zoo. They have a couple of projects together. Now we would like to move into the marine world. And uh, thinking of his father, who was a 1941 graduate of UT in chemical engineering, uh, he naturally came back to UT and went to the, the uh, UT Global Office, um, who made the introductions. We hosted him here at, uh, at the Marine Science Institute in March. 
and we discussed uh, his interests in, uh, in, in uh, not only our research, but uh, what he is trying to do in Mexico. So here is a, uh, the Gulf of California. Um, keep in mind, this is where Brett Baker did his deep sea dive uh, into, the, into the depths of the, of the Gulf. Uh, and this is uh, Isla El Carmen. Uh, this island is, uh, is the island that, uh, that Adrian is trying to, uh, <clears throat> trying to recover from a history of salt mining um, and trying to restore it to its original function and role in marine ecology. Um, that goes from wetlands to estuary to fisheries. So we put together a team of our faculty and uh, we hope to be able to visit the island uh, sometime later in the fall, once travel is permitted again. But it's an exciting opportunity and we look forward to discussing this and exploring uh, the possibilities with uh, uh, Mr. Sada uh, in the very near future. Okay, that's international. Now let's go to regional. Um, environmental impact studies of Harbor Island industrial development. Uh, this is a, a still a very hot topic here locally in Port Aransas and um, and uh, we are doing our best to, um, to help inform the process. Um, it was about six, seven months ago um, that uh, a study was completed on modeling the salinity change from desalination of uh, brine discharge into the ship channel. Uh, the proposed desalination plant that they want to put on Harbor Island is shown right here in the lower right hand corner. And the discharge they're showing is here. The intake for this proposed desalination plant is going to be offshore uh, through a pipeline. Um, however, they wanted to know what the impact would be if they took it off, took in the seawater offshore, but it, but uh, disposed of the brine uh, from the desalination process in the channel. So that study was done. Um, it was posted uh, not only sent to a variety of different uh, uh, users, including the Port of Corpus Christi Authority, um, who actually paid for the study, um, along with the study by Texas A&M Corpus Christi for surge. Um, and uh, that particular study uh, is online at this location. You can see at the bottom of your screen. And basically the bottom line of that uh, uh, takeaway from that study was, it did not appear that salinity would be a big concern. Um, uh, if they disposed of, or if they exhausted or discharged the brine into the ship channel. That does not address, however, um, the additives that go into that uh, in the descaling process of a desalination process. So we're looking into that now. That is here. We're looking to investigate the toxicology of desalination brine and the anti-scaling additives that are added to that. And it's not a small quantity. Uh, we're also uh, beginning studies on um, to model the change in seawater exchange and circulation and the effect on larval recruitment in and out of the or uh, into the into the estuaries with uh, if the channel were to be deepened to 80 feet. We're modeling the change in storm surge with ship channel deepening to 80 feet, and we're modeling the impact of potential oil spills. Uh, at the proposed very large crude carrier, VLCC terminals that are proposed for Harbor Island. All of these studies are intended to help inform uh, the decision-making progress or process, not only at the Port of Corpus Christi, but at the Corps of Engineers and at the, at the city level and, and federal level. So, um, and I've asked Ed to, uh, to uh, be ready to chime in and, and give an update on where we are with these uh, with these studies, and uh, and what we are, and where we are in in the overall permitting process in general, so that we'll hit, get a better idea of, of what's actually happening out there because the flow of information is not very uh, very consistent. So, Ed, do you have a, a moment to uh, to comment on this or to add to what I've just given? Um. So. You know, I, I, ideally, a lot of these studies, you know, we'd like to be able to do them, you know, in, in a little bit more depth. Uh, these studies that Bob just mentioned, uh, they need to be completed by January in order to be able to inform uh, some of the decision processes. A lot of the different aspects of this are a little bit more complicated, and we've been seeking other funding 
to try to look at some of these topics in a little bit more depth, but uh, it's, it's a bit of a challenge to try and uh, address these rather complex problems in, in, a, in a short period of time in order to be able to, uh, you know, in, inform the uh, decision processes. So we're going, the phase we're going through now, we, I've brought in some other faculty members and we've discussed these. We've been having meetings with the port, trying to make sure that we cover all the different most important aspects in these initial studies that have to be completed uh, by January. Oh, Very good. Thanks, Ed. Are, are there any specific, if there's any specific questions, I can, I can try and address those. Yeah, we can pause right here and then uh, if anyone has questions, please do chime in. <coughs> okay, I want to reiterate um, that we have created and we have for, I don't know, since we even began doing these kinds of studies when we started with a salinity discharge study. We've been posting everything here at, uh, on our website. And uh, it was uh, somewhere along the line that it fell several layers below our home screen. So I've asked for it to be pulled up on, on the top again, so that it will be easy to find if you want to learn more about the ecology of the areas that are going to be impacted. <coughs> um, the, <coughs> the study, <coughs> excuse me, um, that we've already posted there. Uh, that was done by a hydrologist in uh, at UT Austin, and every everything else that we that you see here will also be posted uh, at that location to help inform the process. Uh, Bob, I have a question. Yes, Dr. Buskey, can you explain your in-depth study of overall economy and all those other issues that you raised, and um, what's the progress with that study? Yeah, so, and I'd like to thank all the advisory council members and other people that uh, wrote letters of support for that uh, proposal. It was submitted to, to the uh, National Estuarine Research Reserve Neuroscience Collaborative. Unfortunately, they told me they thought it was a great proposal, but it did not get funded. So we're now uh, preparing to uh, send that same proposal in for another uh, competition that will be occurring in the fall. But again, this is, this is the challenge because a lot of these decisions are going to be made soon and the process for getting funding uh, through other channels where we can look at some of these questions in more depth and, and look at societal implications and economic aspects and so on. Uh, again, uh, it's, a, it's always a challenging uh, environment for getting these, this funding and, and so we, we missed the first opportunity, but we're, we're going to uh, sub resubmit to another agency uh, in, I believe, the deadline's in October. Can you give us a short synopsis of what the study was about, and can it be locally funded, just like the Port of Corpus Christi is funding others? Can locals uh, help fund that proposal? Yes, yeah, so, so that, that particular uh, project was what was called a catalyst proposal. So basically what we were trying to do was get a, a, a number of meetings together basically to, to, to brainstorm, but also just to try to get an idea of what the key uh, issues were that would be needed to make by decision makers. And so we wanted to look at both the biology, the, the physics of the estuary uh, and the channel changes, but also to look at, um, look at the uh, value of all the ecosystem services that might be affected by this. So for example, if there's a, a, a bigger um, tidal range uh, created by deepening the channel, how that would impact uh, marsh environments, mangroves, and so on, what, what the effects would be on, on fisheries and property values and so on. So try to look at all the ecosystem services uh, that might be affected by these changes and try to, uh, again, get a consensus on which questions were the most important and, and on what sort of approaches we might take to try to address some of these issues. So it was really just to gather information and get lots of stakeholders involved. So, you know, that potentially still could be done with some other resources. How much do you need? 
<laughs> uh, you really put me on the spot with that one. Um, I think I'd have to go back and look to see what we 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 uh, asked for. But I, I think basically what we we need is just some money to to organize those meetings and uh, and basically you know a lot of times in order to get the stakeholders. Uh, to attend. Sometimes we need some money to help uh, pay for some of their transportation and you know, provide meals and that sort of thing. So uh, it probably wouldn't be uh, an incredible amount of money. Uh, Bob? Yes. Uh, you ha I'd like to congratulate you and all of our MSI for doing a terrific job in a very difficult time. I do have a question, maybe you didn't bring it up intentionally, is whether or not you're able to recruit any new students this coming fall. Yes, we were able to recruit students, but it's, a, it's an attenuated class. Um, I think we've got four or five. Uh, Patty, do you have that number? Yes, we were able to recruit three for the fall, and then with um, Kristen Nielsen coming on board, for fall, she has also recruited a student that will begin in the fall. And we have uh, Jessica O'Connell also recruited a student that uh, will begin in the in the fall, right? Uh, no, that's no. a postdoc. That's a postdoc. Right. So. Right. Okay. So uh, yes, Peter, we were. It is not as robust a class as we normally have. Normally, we uh, we are a, we recruit about eight to ten uh, students every year. Uh, to begin each uh, each calendar year or fiscal year, um, and then but this year has been uh, a little bit difficult uh, due to circumstances. Well understood. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, getting back to the to the regional engagement, um, you know, I've been working or actually Ed, I've asked Ed, you know, to sort of lead the effort on this. And, uh, um, and we want to be able to engage um, every uh, aspect or every faction of, uh, of, the, of, the, of the stakeholders uh, involved. Um, we've been trying to do our best in assimilating the information that we have uh, on the ecology of the ship channel and the surrounding waters, Redfish Bay. Um, and, uh, and in doing these modeling studies, Unfortunately, we do not have a physical oceanographer slash hydrographer uh, at UTMSI. We have one that uh, we recruited uh, for last year that I'm hoping that we will be able to bring on um, in the fall or, or next year uh, to contribute that type of expertise uh, that uh, would, would actually complement every program that we run here, every avenue of research that we do. So we're, uh, we're working towards, uh, towards adding more clarity, more information uh, to help inform this process going forward. I really wish I had a better feel for exactly what the timeline on a permitting and decision-making process was. Um, and that is a little bit more confusing, so. If there are no, more, no other questions on that, um, then I'll, I'll go to my final slide. And I'm sorry if I was too long-winded in uh, presenting all of this, but um, I do want to talk about what might happen in, uh, in February of 2021. I am very hopeful that, uh, that we will see a decline in this COVID situation and that uh, we will be in a position uh, where we'll be able to host everyone in person again. Uh, as I mentioned before, you know, beginning uh, open in, in opening the meeting, uh, it is so much better uh, to be able to be person to person, share conversation, share company, um, and, uh, and mingle uh, with everyone. So I'm sorry that we could not do that this time, and it, it's impossible to simulate or emulate that sort of thing online. But um, we will provide you, uh, everyone, with updates regularly as we start to forecast into into uh, the end of the year and get a better feel of whether we're gonna be able to host an in-person meeting in February. Uh, so that's about all I have to say on that. Um, we'll just have to keep you informed on where we are. 
with that, I, I'm, I've uh, finished my presentation. Is there, are there any questions or any subject matters that, are, that uh, anyone would like to speak about? We can just sort of chat and uh, carry on. Bob, I think you've done a great job uh, protecting the, the uh, scientists, the staff, and the students. This is Oscar, and uh, I hope you're keeping good records of all the communications and steps we've taken to keep everybody protected. And I, I'm glad to hear that you haven't had any serious uh, difficulties with that. Mm -hmm. And I look forward to everybody being together again in February. Do we have the dates yet for uh, February or next August, I guess? Not yet, not, not yet, Oscar, but uh, we will. Uh, we'll get together and figure that out very soon. And we'll be very in good. touch with you for coordinating again, so. Okay, and I'm afraid I haven't uh, paid enough attention to the NERA website, but this uh, website you gave on uh, the studies that uh, Ed's doing is on there. Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. We can send that link out to everyone again, you know, in a separate email if need be. Meanwhile, Ed is on some Caribbean island. <laughs> yeah, it is. It's actually, he's actually got wind in his hair, but notice his hair is not moving, you know, so that's a dead giveaway, Daddy. This has never been a shy group, so please speak up if you have any questions or anything to say. It doesn't even have to be a question. Bob, yeah. this is Elizabeth. Can you hear me? Yes. I okay. If, so if we want to find the children, we go to the website of the uh, MSI website for those children's programs, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. okay. And under the, under the, well, actually, it's the, uh, the are you talking about the, the NERD the Monday, program? Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, the walking on the beach and all that. Oh, yes, yes, yeah. Jace, uh, do you, can you? Pipe in on that? Yes, uh, so we post all the videos on uh, four different Facebook pages, and then oh. after they are released on Facebook, we post them to our YouTube channel, uh, Mission Aransas. Okay. So if you type in Mission Aransas, you can actually subscribe and it'll send you a notification when uh, a beachcombing or something like that comes up. So uh, okay. a couple different ways. Can we, get a, can we get an email out to our advisory council on those, uh, those addresses? That would be great. Okay. Jace, since Wendy is a, uh, a, a citizen of Port Aransas, she would be particularly interested in these things. And I'm wondering if they're, if they're published in the newspaper along with all the other activities of the week that they, that they do, or do you want that much attention paid to them? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. No, that's a great idea. Um, I'll talk with Sally about it. We'll see what we can do. Thanks for the idea. Love that. How is the Wetlands Education Center doing? I haven't heard anything about it for a long time. Go ahead, Jace. Wetlands Education Center. Right. Yeah. So the Wetlands Education Center, the trails uh, were just completed a couple of weeks ago. So it's open. You know, people can go out there 24-7. Uh, it's safe. And, uh, well, wait, so I see Sally shaking her head. <laughs> she must know something I don't. Maybe I'll let Sally uh, bring you up to speed. But it is looking good out there, I'll tell you that, compared to after the storm. Thank you. Well, yeah, the, the trails have been, the construction of the trails have been completed. But technically, since we can't have any public programming, right. that's why it's not open. We do have all the signs that have been um, redone and they're gonna be ordered. And uh, we also, Jace has, um, with his education coordinator, Kristen Evans, they have procured a really cool um, sculpture of a turtle that holds marine debris in it that will be placed over near the ark on the WEC trail. So that's coming up that's new as well. Very good. As I mentioned in my in my presentation, I'm, we are closed to the public uh, until further notice. I think uh, hopefully, you know, as as this evolves, um, we'll we'll keep a sharp eye out for when it's going to be safe to reopen. Uh, but we have to be very careful about all of that. And I think, and I'd like to reemphasize that the nurse staff; these are people, people. You know, I mean, th their programs are meant 
to be public facing. And it's, uh, it, this was quite a blow to them. It slowed them down. I, I mean, it, it put everybody back on their, on their heels, but they bounced back and adapted. And uh, I'd like to call out in, in especially, and one of the things that we could not stop, we had to let the staff that operate the ARC continue to work. It's not as if we can euthanize, you know, all those birds and those turtles. They have to be cared for. Uh, and because we can't have volunteers that normally help the ARC staff on the campus, we had to, they, we had to let them go. We, we got their numbers, but they can't come on campus and work. So the nurse staff volunteered to step in and help the ARC staff with the loss of those, of those volunteers, which was just a tremendous uh, and, and heartening move on their part. So uh, they're, they're doing it incredibly well considering the circumstances that they're operating in. It's a different environment than what they normally operate in. So I know that Jace is proud of them as, as, um, as are we, so. I, I think that your enter, new entrance sign with a seven foot dolphin is truly spectacular. Well, thank you. It's a, it's a marlin. Yep, sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. Whatever it is, it's spectacular. Yeah, it is. It, it, uh, we're, we're really excited about it. Couldn't be more thankful for Kent Olberg. And that was all, you know, we didn't, he just, he just threw that out there. He volunteered all of that. So it's, uh, it's been a, a lot of fun working with Kent. He's going to be here to make sure it's mounted properly. And, uh, and uh, not only that, but he's actually going to be donating a sailfish for the FAML campus, which has never had an entry monument before. So uh, we, we're, we're just planning for that now. We don't, we don't have the resources to deal with it at this time, but we're going to follow through when we do. I want to thank Dr. Gobart for coming and the staff of UT Austin and for all your support. Thank you so much. Most welcome. Yeah. Thank you. It means a lot to the to Bob and Georgia and the whole community there. Thank yeah. you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, David Payton here. Uh, D Dean Goldbart, I want to thank you for the remarks you made about the absolutely brilliant people that are outside of the Marine Science Institute, too. It's, it's nice for us council members to hear about other things that are going on that are so spectacular. And Bob, I want to congratulate you on pulling together this Zoom meeting making it very efficient uh, and uh, easy, easy to do from our point of view. So thank you and uh, we remain safe while we get through this. Thank you. Appreciate that, David. Thank you. Okay. All right, unless we have any other, any other comments, questions, suggestions? Bob, I'd like to just say one more thing if I may. Yes. Uh, uh, thank you for your splendid report. Uh, as I was listening to it, I was thinking e even in the absence of COVID-19, uh, the Institute would have had a terrific year. And thank you. Uh, and to do that in the face of the pandemic is absolutely remarkable. So uh, congratulations to everybody and keep up the great work. And thank you very much. And to everybody else, be well. And as always, thanks so much for your support. Thank you. Thanks, Bob. Okay, thank you, Taddy. And what, you all stay safe out there. And um, I can't wait to see you all in person again. I miss the social. Um, I miss being able to hobnob and dance between tables and, uh, and just, <laughs> just chat, you know, just chat. Um, so uh, we're gonna do our very best to make it uh, real in February. Um, and if, if we have to wait till May, we'll, we'll do it then. So um, we will get back to normal. Um, that's one of the things I tell our folks here at MSI is that, yep, we're going through a tough spot, uh, but we are resilient. We've been through stuff, stuff like this before, um, and we will prevail. And I ask them to be optimistic and to think positive and look for the bright spot, look for the silver lining, look for the opportunities to carry on. So, um, and I wish you all the same as we move into the fall, uh, be safe um and uh take care of yourselves and each other so thank, thank you. you very much for joining us and until next time okay bye everybody bye everyone good seeing you
Okay, just seeing who the last people are. <laughs> These are the hardcore people. <laughs> okay, see y'all later.